So I'm, um, my name's Jutta Tavranos, and I head something called the Inclusive Design Research Center up in Canada, and it's our 25th anniversary uh, this year. And the IDRC's focus is primarily, um, or has been, how do we design inclusively? And of course, that implies, um, frequently implies, how do we design to include people with disabilities? And usually when you hear the topics AI and disabilities um, together, you think, how can AI help people with disabilities? But what I want to talk about today is how people with disabilities can help AI and help our economy and help the situation that we currently have with respect to um, jobs and our fears regarding jobs. Um, but first, I want to tell you a story, and um, because the realization that I came to um, came about because of a failure, just like um, Jennifer was talking about in terms of her realization coming about uh, because of a failure. And this particular failure that gave me this aha moment was uh, a failure of AI, in fact, multiple failures of AI. I happen to be able to, and some of you may have heard my, my tale of woe before, I was working with our Ministry of Transportation up in Canada who were um, thinking about their 100th anniversary and wanting to um, reformulate how they uh, worked with the various unexpected things that were going to be coming up. And one of their major topics was automated vehicles. and. Um, so I thought, okay, great, I get to play with some of these automated vehicle learning models or AI engines. And um, what I had was a capture of someone that moves through an intersection. These were AI engines that allowed uh, the cars to decide what they were going to do as they approached an intersection, what the, how they were going to react for two things that were within an intersection. I had a 3D capture of someone that um, moved in an anomalous and unexpected way. They moved through the intersection by pushing themselves backwards in their wheelchair with their legs. They went very erratically, and uh, in fact, there were several friends of mine that, that did this. And quite frequently, humans would think, oh, this is strange, and they would grab them and push them back onto the sidewalk, thinking that they had lost control and that this this was not the regular sort of way to travel through an intersection. When I tried um, this particular scenario with the machine models that made the decisions for cars, they all ran these individuals over. Um, <laughs> they said that, uh, come back, these are immature learning models, we haven't fed them a lot of data about how people uh, across intersections in wheelchairs. When I came back, um, can anyone guess what happened? They, they ran them over with greater confidence. So the, the, <laughs> and uh, then I started to think, okay, what is happening here? I looked back at my, um, supposedly these systems are getting smarter and smarter. Uh, back in the 80s, I had worked on a hidden Markov model, which is a type of AI learning model for dysarthric speech. This is speech that um, is anomalous, it's unusual, but it's, it's repeatable. So these individuals could be understood by their family or familiar caregivers, but everybody else can't understand them. And I had data to show how quickly learning, um, the learning models in voice recognition systems could learn to understand them. I tried it with these very, very smart, well-trained, um, high-featured, intelligent voice recognition systems at the moment, and none of them ever reached uh, any recognition rate, which made me realize there is a, f a failure or there is a, a critical flaw in, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's a, a critical mm. flaw in our data analytics. Um, and it originate, and, and also in our preferred scientific method. And this predates AI, it predates all of these concerns that we have. Um, and I've been here <coughs> five minutes. The, it's, and it's not about AI bias. It came about when, during the first wave of big data. The first wave of big data was back in the 1800s when we started to have demographics, and we made assumptions about um, what is an average, or we, we developed the notion of 
the average, the normal, uh, the Gaussian curve, the uh, statistics, etc. But basically, what's happened since then is uh, our systems, our data analytics, our AI, um, a lot of the, the discussions of average, etc., are um, biased against diversity and uh, against variability. And this is um, one of the things that's underlying much of the fear that we have, and it's, it's underlying the uh, vulnerability of our economy at the moment. It uh, causes our assumptions about majority rules, about standardization com conformity when we're talking about training. Um, where it encourages us to um, teach things that are formulaic. Um, I mean, they're, they're, almost all of the things that we've been talking about have started with that assumption. It also um, influences how we think about production and who it is that we originally or that we need to manufacture for what manufacturing looks like. I have so many um, uh, things that I want to say about Michigan as well, but the, uh, and, and uh, the assumptions that we are making about Michigan. Um, but the, the, the biggest piece of it and um, that I want to deconstruct and that gives me some hope and why I make this assertion that people with disabilities can help AI and can help our economy is because at the moment um, what we're doing is we are focusing on the majority, we're focusing on um, the, the typical, the average. And um, if we were to take all of you and we were to plot your needs and characteristics, it would look like this. It would look like a starburst where most of you would be um, your needs and characteristics would be in the center, and the center is what we've been designing for work, whether it's work, whether it's training, whether it's AI, and that leaves us uh, vulnerable to not considering the edge. And people with disabilities and people who are at the margins or at the edge are more different, and that's where we find the diversity, and that's where we find the um, the new ideas, and um, we all know th that uh, diversity, whether it's neurodiversity, whether it's uh, biological diversity, whether it's economic diversity, that is what makes us more dynamically resilient, able to understand and um, react to the unexpected. So um, very quickly, sorry, and I have, oh. So, um, the change that I, I propose is rather than designing for the majority, the typical, the average, um, that we design for the edge first. Um, so forget the Pareto rule, the 80-20, which says design, uh, spend 20% of the effort to, and then you meet the needs of 80% of the population and leave the 20% um, that are the difficult 20% to the last. Instead, what I would encourage is that we design right to the edge, with the edge, and that um, what we've learned in terms of economics is that it may cost a little bit more, it may take a little bit more time at the beginning, but in the end, um, it creates a system and therefore an economy and an AI system that is uh, going to be able to stretch, that is going to be able to uh, flex and that will be sufficient, sufficiently dynamically resilient that it, it can uh, address the changes that are coming in the economy. The thought of training people to take uh, formulaic jobs and applying our industrial thinking to the upcoming um, issues that we're going to experience with respect to the future of work is really setting us up, up for an additional failure. Um, the, one of the things that um, I, I want to very quickly, I'm going to just say three more points. One is um, equity and diversity, all of the equity and diversity um, efforts that we're doing within the workplace, we're basically asking people to compete in um, a game that, they, that was never created for them. And so what we're saying is, yes, you can all equally 
participate here, but your, partici but your participation means that you have to conform to a system and a game that, that wasn't created for you. So rather than doing that, let's look at how we can address the needs of the diversity. Let's design our job systems for the edge as well. Um, and there are so many benefits that come about. This is a disruptive moment. AI and the technology is allowing us to question and to rethink how have we designed, and we've designed it in such a way that, that it doesn't encourage diversity. Um, there, are, there is, however, um, a, a silver lining and an opportunity that comes about with systems and uh, artificial intelligence and the technology. And one of the things that I would encourage us to look at is um, the, the idea of smart platforms, not extractive platforms or the gig economy, but platforms whereby the members and the participants own and govern. Um, so one of the things to think about is um, data co-ops. Uh, where we actually govern and own our own data and we decide what happens to it and who can use it and who we trust with it. Um, the other thing which I don't have any time for because I'm up, because it's time up, but um, for, this is a teaser, ask me about the lawnmower of justice and how I um, have been manipulating the Gaussian curve to allow the AI system not to actually run over my friend and to uh, create better voice recognition systems where I, AI is smarter. <laughs>